here uh, for two reasons, really. The first is that any time one has an opportunity to talk to an artist like Shazia Sekunder, it's a chance to really learn how to see and think through the eyes of one of the most talented artists working today, and to do so in the context of an institution like the Cooper Hewitt that does such great exhibitions and programs just is a way of understanding the richness uh, of the great city we live in. So I'm going to begin, but this is really a conversation uh, between Shazia and myself, which will then turn over to all of you to ask any questions that you might have. And in a way, it's a conversation that began years ago, for me at least, when I started looking at Shazia's work, which, as many of you know, uh, draws upon many different influences, but uh, certainly among the most important are traditions of Persian, Mughal, uh, and Rajput miniature painting, that is, uh, miniature painting, illustrated manuscript painting from Iran in the 16th and 17th century, from India under the Mughal dynasty in the 17th century, and then from the various Hindu uh, dynasties that ruled different parts of India. But I want to begin at the beginning here tonight, uh, Shazia, and talk about the installation that is really the genesis of this conversation. Uh, and you've brought together an uh, incredibly disparate body of material from miniature paintings to illustrated medical texts to uh, jacquard woven signatures from uh, the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, to even calligraphic exercises. So, Talk to us a little bit about what was in your mind. What were you trying to do, and why were these different kinds of objects so interesting to you? Well, I um, had no hesitation to pull things that seemingly did not have a relationship to each other, because I think the premise was that there can always be a relationship that can get created. And I um, basically mine through, um, you know, miniature paintings with that same premise. I don't have like a predetermined way of looking at it even over the last 15 or more years. But there's always an element of surprise and there's always a new way to engage. And I think um, intuitively that that's uh, the thrust of the show. But at another level, I think um, I immediately knew that I would like to, to look at the Sackler's collection, because again, uh, Cooper Hewitt being under the Smithsonian umbrella, it was a it was a nice um, um, access also, and um, and I was very aware that you know I might not get the pieces that I would like to show, so there was already like a, a kind of flexibility that had to be embraced. So with that in mind, um, you know more or less everything that I saw had resonance at some level. And that was the first impulse, was to just go peruse through through their collection and then use that as a lens to identify objects that might um, enhance or, or um, bring out new relationships with, with the selected objects. So, so that, that really uh, was the formation and thus, you know, um, there, there seems to be like a, quite a range. Um, but for example, um, the medical books, they, when I saw those books, I immediately knew that they had a relationship to the works that I had in mind at the Sackler because there was this sort of um, focus on the human body and also those, um, a kind of a composite form because they are fold-out books and you can keep delving into detail and they sort of, the whole entire space maps itself out. And that's sort of a way where I look at the miniature in that same manner that it's so compact and it has such an density visually that goes not just horizontal and vertical on the surface but goes in depth. And, and, and playing on that, you know, there could be a relationship. So that was just one of the examples. Um, that, that, I, that I can think of. Now, you, you chose miniature painting as a kind of language, almost, uh, to use. And it's an unusual language. I mean, it's certainly uh, a tradition that had uh, more or less lost a lot of steam uh, during the sort of late colonial period, and yet you've turned to it, you've revived it, you've found something new and exciting in it. 
Why did you turn to miniature painting uh, as a student? And what is it about the language of miniature painting that engages you? I think uh, it is really important to uh, put at least my um, situation in context to, it was 87, 86, and that time in Pakistan, in Lahore, at the National College of Arts, where uh, miniature painting has become a big institution now, um, there was this uh, um, idea that, you know, it's military regime, it's the Yaz period, it's fairly cl um, closed, and um, going to the art school is definitely a, a gesture in opposition, because you're going to an institution, maybe one of the only co-ed institution, that encourages free thinking. So at that time, when I uh, went to, to the National College of Arts, I uh, did not gravitate towards miniature painting because it embodied everything opposite to um, what I was imagining and where you know my interest lay. But at the same time, I also became quite aware that there were different uh, ways in which um, other aspects of art were being um, taught. And they were very much weighted under a colonial influence. It was very much there. Uh, you know, sculpture was still plaster of Paris and making uh, landscape paintings. And things were still sort of uh, in, uh, structured in a very traditional fa manner that giving them the, the label of, of if of a, a more critical way of engaging with the arts really seemed, uh, it fell short. So at that time, it was the irony embedded in the miniature painting, which already had been designated as a craft-written problematic space, uh, that, that it was like, it was an absolute. It came in packaged in that way, that I thought that here was something that uh, I could really engage with and, and, and see uh, where, how it came to that, to that resignation, because it did spark um, conflicting um, uh, responses, you know, as a society in, in general. It was something that people wanted to adhere to because it, it supposedly had a little bit of a cultural premise and a cultural representation of this was supposed to be the culture if it was a, in a, in a more official capacity, and at the same time, it was you know not inventive enough. So it was not you know um, high, in terms of a, a hierarchy, it, it was not as significant as pursuing painting, for instance. So, so the, that that uh, time w in Zia's period, uh, I think that the the how to navigate that social response and. So I, I kind of gravitated to that. And um, when I pursued it and I opted to take it as a major, it was immediate rejection from, from a, lo a lot of the different uh, other departments. And I thought that was a good um, uh, point because I was perhaps looking for a tension situation, something that, that was ne less uh, placid and less um, it just you know, existing. Because the environment at that time is such that you are, you have Hadood ordinance, you have all these absolutely um, horrible uh, laws overriding uh, uh, public behavior, but at the same time you can get away with it, they're not imposed, but the fear is there and it's, it's nonetheless, it curtails, there's a censorship air in the, air very much uh, in the culture. So, so nuances of, of how people respond to your actions you know, at a fairly young age is, is very instrumental and I think it was an intuitive uh, process to, to embrace it. But then um, it provided an anchor right away and an incredible um, um, uh, problematic space to, that one had to basically you know, um, paint yourself out of. <laughs> it, it it was a difficult uh, that that tension came along, and I and and that that would be I think with distance um, perhaps the reasoning. So did you see it as an act of rebellion or resistance? Um, neither, but definitely a m more substantial um, pursuit at that time than than anything else that I had encountered or had uh, exposure to. 
So one of the ironies of your turning to uh, a visual language that was being rejected, even maybe scorned by uh, your peers, and certainly by an art world that had absorbed a kind of colonial paradigm, is that now uh, there is a whole body of work being produced by artists who have also turned to miniature painting, that, that some of the subversive dimensions that you were teasing out of it, uh, the sense of uh, providing an alternative language, has become now a current language. Yes. Uh, is that, do you think about what, what, what you've done uh, and what that means? Well, I think that the great thing is that there's a larger amount of participation. I, whenever there's a big participation, you know, it, it, it changes its um, situation, like the, the surface changes. So we can't, we can no longer see it in that context. So um, there's more dialogue. I fairly, was fairly isolated when I was uh, teasing out ideas and and uh, looking through books and you know reading about uh, I remember uh, having uh, looked at the great uh, Akbar book that that you uh, had written and you know I never made the connection even like later when I was at RISD and later like I'd never made the connection that it was actually the same as Dr. Glenn Lowry <laughs> but it was, it was my twin brother so <laughs> it was a very interesting way of accessing, you know, and so I became aware of the processes of, of how information is accessed um, and how definitions are created because if you're looking at printed material out of catalogs printed by the Smithsonian or the British Library and then you look at that as your, that's your reference, you, you're not really looking at actual miniature paintings and then so you're obviously limited by the selection that has been made for that book. And, and then, you know, books are not that abundant. So you get the few that are at the library and the few that are at the class. And, and so you're, you're already um, creating a language which, is, uh, which has been pre-sort of uh, sampled. So it's, it's very, uh, for me, it was a very objective relationship. It was, it was, it was fragmented. It was never like out of a, a cultural purity in any sense. So. And so that uh, kind of uh, becomes a complicated situation, you know, as, as, as the residue of the colonial history because, you know, it makes complete sense to reject this art form in general for the intellectual movement because it's laden with all these issues. But it's a, it's, it does not negate the fact that there could be a way to engage with it that opens up the whole Pandora box and, and allows, as an artist, a lot of substance to play with. And that, that's where I, I felt that it had, it had enough legitimacy to, to be explored. Let's talk a little bit about how you do that, because miniature painting as a tradition is a very codified and rigid tradition. It has, uh, it's not unlike uh, Nabuki in uh, theater. It has a set of rules that are very disciplined. It has a set of subjects uh, in which the variations are uh, very carefully uh, regulated. And you've exploded that apart. You've, in a sense, taken the, the kind of finesse of miniature painting and the means of representation of an individual uh, object and somehow made it into a very personal language, something that is about yourself as much as it is about a reference to an earlier tradition. How do you do that? What, how, do you, how do you look at the different, what are the sources that you pull together uh, when you're thinking about making uh, an image? Um, well, it's not limited to any one thing. It's definitely not limited to just miniature paintings because I, that, that is already sort of a vehicle I've chosen, so it's a formal sort of device at times and I have to be pretty much cautious of its usage because I, I don't want to be um, dictated by it. The things that inform me is like everything, like media, literature, um, um, other artists work for sure, um, you know, definitely what's going on um, in our culture, in the larger uh, political environments and everyday life, like things that, that that 
that will spark something will become archived and I will explore and do research and, <coughs> and then, you know, have the miniature painting just as one of the threads that can be, that can be brought in to create a visual language that, that makes sense to me. So, so it's, it's a culmination of, of all of it. It's not that different, I guess, for, for the way other artists work. You know, our painters are always culling information from, from all types of sources. And so I find that this emphasis on the miniature painting uh, has its place. Like, to, for today, it, it has definitely um, a, a, a very significant place. But sometimes when there's too much focus on the miniature, it becomes um, a, a problematic space. Because that, that's where I think people People are, are perhaps trying to see that um, maybe they need to know more about miniature painting to access the work or to, to, uh, to um, or that they would be limited if they don't know some of the references that are being brought up. And I, I'm interested in that, the la that, that idea of translation and what gets translated and what doesn't and, you know, the idea of reality and our perception about it and the caricatures that get created or things that get embraced and have a life and things that history and provenance, things that, you know, you don't know exactly the entire, in anything's history in its entirety. It's always a selective process and our, and our assumptions are what, what gets championed towards the end. So, so there's all these gaps that are left. And, and that aspect of miniature painting in, informs my way of, of, of being creative, is to be aware of this, or be aware of the gaps and the missing links and, um, and, and not take them for granted. So there's humor, perhaps, that will fill the space where you would, you know, obviously not take something as a, as a complete given, you know, whether it's something you're reading in the press, whether it's something you're, you're, you're being told about, even the history of, of uh, historical, like, you know, documentation on miniature painting, like the titles for miniature paintings, for example, are very arbitrary, are they not? Did you Completely. make up a few also? All the time. <laughs> of course, they're, you know, some of them have, uh, miniature paintings never have titles, generally, right? They're simply embedded in a manuscript, and uh, as you're reading the manuscript, you know that uh, this is a story of Leila and Majnun, and there's Leila and Majnun. So when they, when they were removed from manuscripts, because European collectors in the 19th century uh, couldn't read Persian uh, so, or, or, or Arabic, so what they did was they were interested in the visual image that they could understand. And so they started to unbind the manuscripts and treat the individual miniature as if it was an autonomous object, like a painting. Well, at that point, they needed to give it a name. Uh, and if they uh, knew enough about the story, they could figure out that uh, a relative title. But they're made up. They're, uh, they're always made up. And then, of course, when you get into Indian uh, miniatures, which don't even necessarily relate to stories and manuscripts, they become a uh, wise old man leaning on a rock. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Like, so, uh, you know, it was very hard to be inspired by uh, the literature, for instance, that accompanied the image. I never gravitated towards, uh, towards that. I basically made up a position where I was less interested in reading um, the paragraph or two that accompanies the usual image. After all the work I did? <laughs> Because I, I found it very, um, you know, descriptive and not very, um, there's no adventure. You're not making any critical assumptions. You're just saying the man stands in front of the tree and he's wearing a red dress and he holds this in his hand and it could be this, but we're not sure or whatever, you know. So <laughs> I always found that as an as a art historian that I had first thought I would perhaps pursue miniature painting as an art historian because I uh -huh. was I became interested and I as I became interested I, I knew that there was a vacuum there um, in terms of, of, of how it was being presented and understood it was primarily in people's drawing rooms as tourists kitchen and, and that's the extent of, of an interest so but then you know 
I, 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 it was too confining <laughs> and too rigid to have that type of a lens, and then it became more like something that might be used as a as a place of, of um, confinement. But then to break out of it and and work as a as a as an artist, so with obviously a lot more freedom. But that uh, that absence of of uh, removing the text at times and just engaging with the image you know made helped me uh, navigate through different schools and different periods with no particular allegiance to anything so i i get all like uh, nervous when it's like oh i have looked at congra or I've i i don't know i've looked at everything <laughs> and uh, everything has uh, has moved uh, all over you know and i've looked at at the early at, uh, Renaissance painting, at the same time, in and the the miniature painting, you know, it's not just uh, Persian and Indian; it goes all the way into East Asia. Also, like a particular style and a particular stylization that 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 can that that is not necessarily rooted in just the miniature painting, but um, some of those uh, um, ways uh, that some of uh, this commentary is sometimes placed, I think, a little unfairly on an artist. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it just makes it a little harder to then um, um, respond because it's never that precise or in a, you know, um, a, a, a kind of a, a parameters are never that rigid. And I think that that's how I, I felt using a few works from the Sackler to uh, allow me to to find things that would have a nice interaction with the selected works. So that that was a, it's a, I, I see it as a very similar parallel to to how I, I will seek uh, visual information. You know, I, I will like for example for I, I will show some examples. Why don't perhaps we, it's a maybe moment. we can like. Um, okay, sorry. So, uh, for example, like here, you know, I, I have always looked at uh, the Safavid school that has, that uses architecture, which I think here, the Bezad's painting, which is down uh, in, one, in the show here. Um, this sort of, the, these architectural devices formal devices, very interesting uh, ways of, of uh, elaborating the pattern, but at the same time, it, it kind of has a relationship space, has a psychological relationship. Uh, there's, um, there's an interior event occurring. There's always a reference to the exterior, the spiritual world. And, I, it, and I've always felt that the, red, that the sort of red fence that that comes along, why it was always painted red. I haven't really dug out enough literature on that. And so I, I have used it, for instance, um, in ways where, you know, in my work. So there are, there are ways in which an element will reside with me for a long time and I will end up using it. But I, as I was looking at, um, at Bezard's piece, I uh, came across the Ilanka Karash's work, mm -hmm. which is quite fantastic. The scale of it, in particular, against Bezard, and then at the same time, you know, they, she was definitely aware of, of, uh, of and had an interest in, a, in Asian art also. So, and it also reminded me of a very early work of mine, a scroll painting that, that takes apart Safavid interiors mm -hmm. and has very similar textures. So I, I don't have that here, but I was quite alarmed that I, it, there were so many similarities. I'd never known about her work before. Um, so there, there is that reference to Beth Bessard's piece. Then um, the, uh, uh, as I was mentioning this earlier, but the border on the outside is actually uh, from a, a portfolio I have, which is um, Henry Cousins is the photographer who compiled it in 1906. 
And uh, I have that particular portfolio, which was reprinted in, in Pakistan in 1993. And I use that as a reference. But then I was told here by um, one of the curators that the outside border actually ha is in their collection also. So again, you know, a very strange way of arrival uh, to something that was not intentional, but it's uh, very much part of, of uh, having like that sort of colonial history also. And sampling has always been in vogue for centuries. <laughs> you use the word sampling. And I, I want to pause there for a moment. Well, it's perfect while this, uh, which is one of Shazia's most recent paintings that was done specifically in response to the various works that she had selected for the exhibition that's upstairs. But you use the word sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and it's interesting to me because when I look at your work and think about it, I actually think a lot of uh, the kind of collaging that Robert Rauschenberg did in his silkscreen paintings. That you just, you're pulling a whole range of images. It's almost an endless variety of possibilities that you are then collaging or tiling into a single image, fusing them into something of your own. But in, in, Rauschenberg, in Rauschenberg's case, those images were deeply charged politically. They're not, he, 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 there's no formal play, although he's obviously uh, understands the formal relationships. He's, he's picked images because of their specific political charge. Do you pick images at all because they signify some political or social issue? Yes, like uh, when I had, this piece was made at the end of, of the entire experience here. So I had already selected the works at the Sackler and then the works here were selected. So there was a uh, kind of a trend that was shaping in the exhibition that went um, to the declaration, the signatures of the Declaration of Independence. Then there are lots of like ribbons that are of past US presidents and, and you know, the whole um, election scene was unfolding for the last sort of year while I was working. So there, I knew that I, I was going to sort of delve into that. And I had these figures in mind. So I, it seemed very appropriate to take the architecture of Bezar then use it as a, as a, a symbolic place on which something is sort of falling. So, you know, so there, there is a reasoning within the given circumstances. So I, ha I had the Bezard work, so I was going to find something from within that work. So there, there, there is always um, a particular reason, as I say, construct a piece. And um, I, I don't see it as collage, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, I don't know why, I, I still feel like my uh, connections um, don't end in that piece. Mm -hmm. And they have a history, I archive information, they have a very, uh, there's a language, there's things archived under humor, there are things archived under politics. Uh -huh. So there is that language that uh, they um, embrace or symbolize. And then when I go and take something from that archived information, it carries a meaning. So they, they, it's less about collaging things for a composition and moving on to the next. And um, sort of elaborating, I guess, on that point, I have to go through to one image here for um, example, like, you know, the, I, um, I was also, I had training as a calligrapher, so I enjoy calligraphy. I also, what I really appreciate about uh, Islamic calligraphy is really the underlying geometric mm -hmm. um, knowledge. It's very important. It's like, again, having a, a, a fluid way of uh, fluidity about any language. Mm -hmm. And then you can construct and be original and you know, have, have a little bit of, 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 of your own come through because you have a bit of a command. So like um, uh, uh, doing calligraphy without 
grasping the geometry of it mm -hmm. is very difficult. It will look terrible, it just doesn't make sense. So I wanted to show examples of calligraphy that are pure exercises. They don't have anything. So this piece is, is mushk. It's just an example of, uh, of it's called the shikasta mm -hmm. style. So I guess uh, you can elaborate on that one. <laughs> well, it, well, a mashk is, a, is, a, is literally a kind of formal exercise that a calligrapher would do in the shikasta script. Uh, it's a very beautiful script, but it's the broken script. If you look, if you know, if you study uh, Persian writing, it comes, they're, very, they're different styles. Uh, and this is perhaps the most complicated and, and difficult one because the elements of the letters actually break apart, as you can begin to see in the way this thing almost becomes an overall pattern. And the paper is moved. It has like um, two sides or multiple sides, multiple direction. Yeah. So it would be, would you say that it's a non-classical form then? It's, it's an, well, they, it is the latest of uh, classical forms of Persian uh, writing, Persian script to have developed. It's the one that's really right out at the edge. It takes a kind of uh, very elegant script called Nastalik, yeah. and it breaks it apart. It, you know, if you, if you love the, the kind of elegant uh, swings of Nastalik, this looks like somebody had taken a butcher's knife and done Cut this to up. it. So is this a movement that ha was n naturally sort of occurring? Like experimentation within the calligraphy is a very significant movement as early as 9th century. Yes. So wouldn't you, like, couldn't you see that as an exploration of abstraction? Or like this exploration of, of, of the calligraphers, you know, um, looking into calligraphy as an art form? Well, I think the thing that makes calligraphy in the Islamic world so fascinating, as opposed to uh, in the West, is that it, the, the Arabic script, of which Persian uses essentially, is based on the Arabic script, although it adds some letters, has a certain elasticity to it that uh, doesn't exist in uh, either Cyrillic or the Roman alphabet. You can stretch letters, you can compress letters, uh, and thus it lends itself to being manipulated in, in ways that become visually interesting. So for a calligrapher, you master a certain tradition, but then you, like the, the classic Arabic uh, tradition is Kufic, these very squared off letters. Uh, but then you, start, you learn that you can do some different things with it. And, so you start to say, well, what would happen if I twisted it and I braided it? I took those squared off letters and started wrapping them around each other, and then you get animated kufik. Well, what would happen if I drew a little bird in there? So it's a very, it's a tradition that has an awful lot of life to it, right? And so this is maybe its most uh, dramatic, and, and in many ways its latest manifestation, because this follows uh, a whole line of earlier uh, scripts. But even in something like a broken script, Shikasta, there are rules and regulations, as you were saying. There are, you learn how to do this. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to uh, quickly add that when I was studying like, or looking at this, I was also looking at Bryce Martin. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it, it's like uh, there is always, there's an endless way of, of like, look, uh, look, yeah, but. So I would say I was not necessarily looking at Bryce Martin. I would be looking at this, but through, through his lens. Uh -huh. So it's it's like you can keep. I would reverse these things. So, so it's not miniature painting is is not the essential essential thing. It's not like a limitation or, or just the most significant aspect of of one's thinking. But it's you know it's a playful um, system which which. Uh, which remains fairly open-ended. So um, talking about rules, I think the next work elaborates that. But before I move forward, I wanted to just share that when I uh, uh, looked at um, um, Jacquard, uh, the, the, the signatures, then you know, the idea again came that here is the replication. Because it, does, uh, it talks about, um, it says on top, facsimile of the signatures to the Declaration of Independence 
taken from Irving's History of the U.S. with John Quincy Adams certified were exact imitations of the original. Yeah. Like that line in itself uh, was quite interesting and, and I used that when I did a drawing and I repeated exact imitation of the original twice. So it was also the idea uh, for me, you know, again, is like how something will inspire me to, to, do a, to do my own work or to do another drawing or a sketch. So here was really about, again, time, having the luxury of time and looking at these objects with, you know, so much time has passed by and, and the authority that they, they had is obviously can be questioned or altered or so that there is this play that time, for me, I would say when I was looking at shaping the show, is like time does become the nemesis of authority in that sense. And um, also um, here, another example in the show, which, which was uh, wonderful to come across this example because it did clearly um, share the geometric underpinnings, like the, the a unit is the measure, and there are certain measures or certain units that create the length of the of the letter. And that unit is the tip of the pen, so it's it's embedded in your tool. So you can like you can measure it visually as well as um, by placing the dot there. So I, uh, but in of itself, you know, it's a fantastic design, like a visually very appealing piece. So then. Uh, this I have to um, read because I, I was very interested in um, Langley. Uh, when I came across Langley, I, this is what I'd written. It said, illustrated with a large selection of copper plate engravings. So Langley's uh, book, The New Principles of Gardening, it sheds light on how to pioneer a new approach between nature and art through landscaping, questioning the artificial and contrived aspects of human intervention. He proposes, quote unquote, regular irregularity, where an intervention that mimics nature is encouraged. The geometric diagrams in this book are fine examples of the strategy of such a use of space. Langley calls for the subliminal simplicity of nature with subtle manipulation of the landscape. Mm. So I find, I found the geometric patterns quite compelling, but it did inspire me to produce. Uh. This piece is called Fun Around the Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here it is really about creating a structure through, through geometry, but at the same time, you know, it's got a little bit of a camouflage thing with elements like the gopi hair that I've used in the past, which actually is one of the designs in a, in a um, camouflage, uh, one of the older out of use camouflage design has a little bit of a, of a shape that mm -hmm. looks like that. And then it says stalemate in there too. So, you know, and then of course Langley, the, the title, the name, <laughs> so, it, so there's no limit, I think, in terms of, of how you sample something. It's, it's not, so I wouldn't say, like, just to show this example, I would say it's, I'm not making a collage here. And to just want to play around with, with words for a moment. So would you, would you equate sampling with appropriation? Are they uh, parallel activities, the same activities, unrelated? Um, yeah, I think um, I, I don't have much command of how, exactly what, how, what all appropriation in uh, art uh, a, a critical context entails. But, you know, what I'm doing is that I would, I would seek by choice an element in any work that I'm looking at and, and see where the potential is. So if I can cull something, then the idea is how to transform that particular element into something else and document that process. So that transformation becomes the, um, the, the whole idea and the thrust mm. of the intention. It's not about just taking something and, and, uh, and um, placing it next to something else to add volume. It's really about taking something and transforming it. And that's always 
you know, a challenge because not everything you can come to gr grips with in clever ways and, and some things uh, don't have an inherent ability to, to uh, transcend a read and some, some images might have the potential. So, so there is a play between representation and abstraction. A, a majority of the language in the miniature painting is, is more or less stylized and representational. So if I, if I take something from there, I'm usually inclined to transform it into something It's quite its opposite. You've talked about archiving your work through different um, categories. Uh, is irony one of those categories? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Irony and, you know, and nuances. So, so many times I think in, in my work, like, for instance, you know, these things can, can, are not necessarily always obvious. Like, I, this work will not carry the Langley <laughs> uh, well, with it. Be interesting, but of course it's a, it's a terrific reference. Yeah, but, you know, so it, it may, somebody later who might comment on it, may not necessarily know that connection and not all the time those connections were spelled out. Mm -hmm. I think in my, like earlier, like 10 years ago, uh, when, when I had some opportunity when I first moved from Houston here, a lot, a lot of that time I think uh, a lot of the references, a lot of the nuances got lost because um, I wasn't, uh, you know, things got, uh, the, the way things get written in, a, in, in, a, in short, uh, press situations or something. So when the focus was so much about uh, identity and and who you are, where you're from, and from K Pakistan via Houston, it it just adds this, you know, an elaborateness which is basically useless. <laughs> yeah, where does it go? It only creates more baggage for both sides. <laughs> so true. Yeah, and so to. You know, to kind of work yourself through and around all of that, miniature painting is less of a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, do you have, let, if you don't have more slides, or do you have some um, more slides? N I'll, I will show, I, I don't know, yeah, maybe. Because I want to make sure have we have no time I have no idea if we have time or not. I am fine stopping here. I'll just show them because it's just visual. It was a very interesting, I found a cop, not an exact copy, but almost a very similar um, painting in the uh, prints and drawing department after I selected the one on the left at the uh, at the Sackler, then the Karakami, which is which is really quite beautiful um, stencils, yes. the Hamza Nama, which allows you again to play with narrative because this this is so much about local. Uh, narratives getting assimilated and 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 diff it's in different languages and it's it's very sort of uh, fluid like that that it allows you to uh, uh, for me it was an ins ins inspiration to have freedom to create a narrative at the end with my final piece in the show and then here Cornelis piece that inspired this drawing mm. <laughs> so you know so it's the little things that that uh, that when you look at it, you wonder, like, why, what can I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> and coming back here, just the, the books really fold out, unfold in ways that are very incredible. Like, you can really go open the uh, face and the skull and <laughs> go right into, into details. And I, I found that really. Oh, uh, that sense, similarity of like unpacking a space in the miniature and going back into it endlessly. And portraitures were uh, the idea of how portraiture shifts into caricature. This is a, such a powerful portrait of an elderly Shah Jahan. And you know, I had placed it next to the Langley because Shah Jahan was responsible for the fabulous uh, garden constructions in, in, in India and in Pakistan, the Shalimar Gardens and, and this idea of nature and nurture and, and intervention um, into nature, how that can be controlled. So Shah Jahan was really responsible for that. So um, I did place the connection there. And then some ideas of how stylization almost 
resembles caricature. And then Salah's book, obviously, you know, we all like it's it's quite hilarious, but it does indicate that other uh, aspect of caricature with the humor, a little vulgar, but very much of its time. And then um, uh, the ribbons, which also had uh, portraiture and especially Lincoln's, which, which had a very interesting history of how he gets idolized and becomes like a big real, like a, people are interested in his image all the time. And whether he's uh, questions about his looks and his handsomeness or something. So there, there, there is, um, uh, I'm, I'm like bringing portraiture through, through the ribbons also, but ribbons were really about the jacquard mm -hmm. and jacquard being, a, a, again, one of the early sort of, you know, um, usages of, of, uh, of a mechanism that... Systems. Systems, yeah. I guess... Let's take, let's take a couple of questions from the audience just because I want to make sure that everybody has, has time. There's a hand up. Yes, please. Speak loudly and we'll all hear you. Thank you. Um, one of the terrific programs that people who put together was going to see your exhibition at um, the Jenkins Gallery where you made beautiful drawings of novice Buddhist monks, young boys, and then um, a video of that as well. And that, of course, plays on this idea of uh, portraiture. But was that an anomalous kind of way of working to make this very beautiful, sensitive, individualized portrait drawings with that project, or is that something you're continuing to do? I think I have pursued portraiture. It's always been a thread in my work. It has uh, it, it's, uh, been a means of, of soliciting other people into the work and um, bringing characters or personalities, you know, people I, I might be politically inclined with to show up in the work and so there's there is definitely throughout portraiture has has been significant but in that particular project it really uh, I gravitated towards the the rituals that that were being um, um, that I that I encountered and when I first came to Laos so they were the individuals they were the young boys and they were the monks and the novices in training so you know, the only way, to, so, so portraiture became almost like an immediate response that I had at that time. It was also the simplicity of the graphite and paper in an, in a, in, in a, in an environment that, that was econo economically quite, you know, difficult. Like that was going to be the only platform that would make sense to engage with where they could also participate in the drawing. Well, the the good thing is that um, you know they, they I have given support and I will go back and we'll get clear idea of of how that has uh, has been used. But it was also with the intention that it services what they need than than me trying to impose something. Yes, sir. animated miniatures done oh so several years ago at the Asia Society we saw a wonderful exhibition that you did uh, consisting of, of miniatures that were animated through I think director 8 software is that a a vein that you're still working in or have you walked away and left it or what's the state of that work I um, the one the, the, the one that Asia Society I, I did some more after that so um, I have about five um, animations and uh, it hasn't it's not I never walk away from from things I, I have they're all always open so I will um, I have some um, new work uh, next opening on Friday the third um, at Sikama Jenkins and there there's another extension of that work it uses a uh, text and music and uh, and uh, uh, video so th it is really sort of an extension of, of the animation. So you, you do please come and see that. <laughs> Shazia, on the animations, uh, and I haven't obviously seen uh, the newest one, 
But one of the things that's so striking, to me at least, is one, how much more you can get out of uh, one of these images that you've created. Uh, and the second is that at least I read into them this kind of move to entropy. Uh, and I wonder if, because if, they all seem to sudden, you know, break apart, so you begin to understand, it's as if the constituent elements start to have lives of their own. And then it always seems to me at least that they kind of implode on each other. And I wonder if that's just a complete misreading on my part or something that you're trying to work through. No, I think it's pretty close, a read. <laughs> it, is, uh, it, it, it is really a fascination about, again, the transformative nature of an image and its, uh, and its uh, extension into either a new space or, or it's the end of the space, you know. So, so how much service can come out of that? Uh -huh. So there is that. But um, I think I... Uh, uh, do like to create sort of a sense where, you know, it's very organized in the background. There are tons of movements, but it, it may imply a lot of, like a very organized, chaotic sort of existence, and then and, and it slowly builds itself, itself and then dissipates. So, so there, there is that, I think, pattern in all the animations. And um, that's very much uh, something that I see in the miniature potential, like, how an image can, not necessarily in the miniature, but in the, in the struct geometric structures, like the idea of infinite uh, possibilities, infiniteness through, through a mapping of, of the same form endlessly and then bringing it back into a singular situation. Like that idea is really at, at, at the core. Again, maybe I'm you know, sort of reading into, into images, uh, issues that may or may not be there. But it, because you, you, at, you know, earlier times have talked about turning to miniature painting almost as a subversive act, uh, one of the things that always uh, fascinates me about the animations is that they're, they're, it's as if they take a system, uh, make the system evident by showing you, in a way, its, its composition, but then really demonstrate that no system in the end can be self-sustaining. And yeah. it's almost as if it, it has a kind of political uh, charge to it. Yes, I, I totally agree. I think the title for one of them that you might be referring to, Pursuit Curve, yes. also implies that it was very much about, you know, who, what is following, uh, who is following um, who, and then uh, who's the prey and who's the hunter, and then where does that chase end, or is it an endless uh, geometric, uh, you know, mathematical situation? So, so there is. Uh, I'm I'm attaching all of this meaning to that to in that title also that, that it's never clear, mm. but it's that chase which is which is very significant and um, something that I, I I would like to figure out ways of, of illustrating. So when the, the turbans, you know, uh, sort of like move, up, move around, they could, they usually, they may look like butterflies or, or like insects. But it's only like after five minutes have gone that you realize that it's actually, when it settles down, it's, it's, a, it's the turban. And then the turban carries, you know, all these other associations. So political, cultural, um, <coughs> They, 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 or just outside of that, just as a, as a form, but also in the Sikh miniature mm. painting, it's a very significant uh, compositional device in, in, in that particular school of painting. So, so there, there, there is that um, undermining an expectation or, or hoping to transform and, you know, um, uh, change somebody's already as assumption about, about what an image means. And I think animations were really uh, driven out of feedback where people would sometimes question that they may not know the sources that I'm referring to. And I thought that animation then allows me to navigate them. So you don't necessarily need to know if there is or not any particular reference being made to a historical miniature painting. 
Most of the time there isn't. <laughs> but the assumption usually is there that people would assume that. And then the animation, I think, allows people to, 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 to dispel that and just navigate through, through, through that. You know, the process of transformation is visible, so you see it. Other questions? Yes, please, with your hand up right there. When you started studying miniature painting, and you um, and it was a you looked at it as a subversive 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 act, um, and entered into that department, was it subversive? I mean, it, it had a negative reaction in the modern um, in the part in the mainstream departments, but in the department itself, was there an agenda that you were working with and? You know, was there uh, any kind of um, modernist agenda, or was it a, an agenda to resurrect, or like mm -hmm. how? Yes, I th at that time in '86, I was uh, one of the two students, and um, ev then at that time, my relationship with the one and only faculty, Dr. Bashir Ahmed, is is very interestingly defined because. I uh, was uh, already hoping to be in the painting department, and so to, to, for him to get a student out of the painting into the miniature department was a very big coup. Yeah. And he really was very excited at, at a collaborative place where I think it was also to put the miniature painting in a different place. But he also, I think, uh, obviously, you know, the, the, it's an, a kind of a pseudo-apprenticeship platform at that time where you are supposedly taking an apprenticeship with the person, but it's within the, the modern setup of a school, uh, a, a college. So uh, I, it was very fluid. And I had to like respect him and his way of teaching and at the same time um, go ahead and, and explore things that I had to do and question what he was doing. So it, 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 was, um, it was a complicated relationship, but professionally, I think it benefited both of us. And at the end, I, I, I was invited to uh, teach, right? As soon as I graduated, I was teaching there. So a lot of the artists that you see here, they were all in my class. So, <laughs> but, you know, but when I started teaching, I did not have that much, uh, I think, independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also realized that I felt like I was pouring out my soul and giving so much. I wanted to do my own work. And a whole year later, I felt like I, I have to make my work. And, and then, you know, acad academia is rife with politics. So it's not the easiest place to, to go into. Um, maybe later when you understand how to negotiate those places, but definitely. That was one of the situations that did not map out, and, and I can't recall. Maybe I was fired, or maybe it just naturally ended. But it, it, it was uh, one, I was the first person ever that he had asked that I would come and teach with. But it did allow, it, it, you know, and then like five more people came, ten more, and I don't know. You know, there are many people who graduate out of the miniature painting department every year now. But what's really interesting is that, in a way, uh, he was trained as a traditional miniature painter. Yes, he had his fact. His teacher was Haji, uh, Haji Sharif Muhammad, I think. He's well he, known. very well known and has a, a lineage with the actual, um, p p like people like well, who were in the courts or something. So he's got. But, so he turned to you, in a sense, as an heir, uh, even though what you do in the end is to uh, explode miniature painting, yes. in a sense. Uh, it's, you know, it's, but it's fascinating. I mean, I think that's a really important thing yes. that he could recognize. He recognizes that, but then, you know, as with anything, it's the duration, it's the longevity. Mm -hmm. So I, I, as an individual, can, I had to not, you know, um, um, sort of as a parallel, not just leave Pakistan, but I had to leave 
as as I think most more or less everybody does, you leave your situation to get objectivity and to explore and to grow. So that that is symbolic of a separation, I think, in general, from where I am now. Because I did not return back to Pakistan. And I have had a career here. I have exhibited here, I've made my work, I've grown. You know, so that rift has has obviously occurred. So so there, there is a very interesting sort of trajectory where it's like a, a kind of a collaboration, but then, you know, um, it does not sort of continue. continue. It continues, I think, in ways that are very significant because it does allow him a lot more attention and there's a lot more people that, that he inherited. And, uh, but at the same time, there is a sense of loss also. Yes, please. Uh, Why did you not choose to exhibit your work that often in Pakistan? Um, I I really don't know how to answer that because a lot of times that I I was never invited. I was never really. Uh, then when I was invited, it was also very complicated because it was expected I would pack my work in a and just arrive with it. And things had happened here where when I first got exposure I, at the drawing center in the Whitney, a lot of the work got, was sold into museums collections and to borrow those works is not that easy. So there, there are very real things that are, that are indicative of the art world and the way the system works. And it's no longer about me carrying my portfolio and saying, OK, I'll just bring everything over. And the nature of the work also is that it takes longer to make the work. So, so there is that. There is obviously the immigration thing. My green card took eight years. And I didn't want to sort of initially never wanted to risk uh, leaving the country because I always had. So there, there are many, many uh, aspects that that were there. I think a lot of it was also I wanted to have more distance because I basically wasn't sure what, if I went back I might end up you know getting uh, pressured by family and others to stay. So there, there is a lot, a lot I think that shapes us as 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 how we make our decisions. But in the end. Um, when I did go much later, it was a very. Uh, it was after September 11th, and the dialogue was very um, um, uh, uh, confrontational, and you know, and and it was all, everything was seen under under the the questioning that I thought you know happened to a lot of other people that that live here. Um, uh, why you're choosing to stay in the U.S. Um, intellectually also, like why, given what is happening. So there is that um, um, aspect that starts to uh, color a, a dialogue. The dialogue always becomes political, and uh, and then there is a um, so there 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 are all these elements, and I think I'm being very honest here in terms of uh, putting it, putting them out there because these are things people ask me, and um, and you know. A lot of my work deals with, uh, with situations that are indicative of the culture that I embrace, that I live here. So a lot, a lot of the work indicative is Indicative really and, and, and critical at times. Yeah. And also a lot of the work in 97 and a co couple of years later was very site specific. I did a lot of wall drawings in different locations. I was not showing very commercially. I was trying to work with smaller institutions and, you know, so I was literally like moving my studio for a month or two uh, with a small museum or an institution teaching, working, and doing a site piece, which was ephemeral, which ended, and, it, and that was the end of it. So there is an exploration of that work also that, that, that is very different from just sitting and making small objects. Let's take one more question. Yes? Um, do you have any particular schools of miniature painting that you really look at and really enjoy from time to time, you know, reference more than others? Um, I think I, I really like uh, Punjab Hill painting. I like the sort of very loose abstract works. I, I always look at those, the ones that have a very textural surface. I, um, I find that at times a, a much more um, 
particular to my interest in its palette than maybe the very refined classical Mughal painting that, that is, is, uh, is very illustrative and almost nothing is like left that you can imagine in it. It's, everything is spelled out. So I gravitate towards looser things. Please thank Shazia Sikandar.